get right to it. Um, I'll begin with the first question. Usually there's no particular order, but today I want to begin really with the questions that pertain. I have two questions here that speak about today's day. Today's a special day in uh, the Hebrew calendar because it is the yard site, the 26th yard site to be exact, of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson, perhaps the most influential rabbi in modern history or even in history altogether. I don't know of another Jewish leader who took a dying nation. If you looked at the statistics in 1945, 1946, after the Holocaust, after six million of our people were murdered by the Nazis, people would tell you scientifically there is no chance that these Jews can live and survive. Um, maybe they'll become a little tribe like those last African tribes, but not more than that. And here came a man with a revolutionary vision, a man that knew no obstacle, knew no challenge, I'm sorry, knew, knew no no's. He knew a lot of obstacles, knew a lot of challenges, but a man that uh, wasn't faced by those obstacles and challenges, and he went full force rebuilding uh, Judaism and rebuilding the world altogether with tremendous optimism with uh, incessant life and with um, a, a belief and a faith in every single Jew and in every single human being that he encountered that was uh, greater than the faith that they had in themselves. And uh, now 50 years later, 70 years later, what are we? The Rebbe assumed the role of uh, the Chabad leadership and of uh, the world leadership in 1951. So 70, what is it? Almost 80 years later, uh, uh, Judaism, thank God, is thriving. There are more yeshivas today in the world than there ever was in Jewish history. And it's a lot thanks to the Rebbe. Not just the yeshiva part, but the fact that Jews can walk with pride, can embrace their Judaism, can connect anywhere they want, in any place in the world, uh, to to their values, to their heritage, really thanks to the Rebbe. And uh, of course, this is just one, one layer of his massive achievements, but there are so many more. And uh, I want to explore these two questions, really, that speak of this day. So as mentioned, usually we don't have a particular order, but today I want to begin with them. First question, more of a personal question, because I had the great privilege of I believe it's more of a personal question because I had the great privilege of meeting the Rebbe a few times as a child. First, when I was um, seven years old, then when I was 11, and then when I was 13. But um, this is the question. I just finished watching a North Suburban Lubavitch Chabad tribute to the Rebbe's yard site. It was excellent. They showed clips of Rabbi Dean Steinzel talking about the Rebbe, etc. My question is, when you met him, what language was he speaking? That's the question. Well, the Rebbe spoke many languages. I think he spoke a total of 18 languages. Wow. Uh, when I met the Rebbe, I spoke with him in French. That was my uh, um, mother tongue, as they say. And uh, the Rebbe spoke French fluently. I remember his French. I can hear his voice still in my ears. Uh, the Rebbe spent some time in Paris. He went to the Sorbonne and studied their engineering. So the Rebbe spoke French. And that's the language I spoke with him. But I'm going to add just a deeper level then I'll move to uh, the next question. I spoke, technically I spoke French with the Rebbe, but really I spoke the language of the soul with the Rebbe as everyone else did. When you spoke to the Rebbe, he went directly to your soul. It was like standing in front of an X-ray, worse, of an MRI, of a CT scan. You use the analogy you want. The Rebbe saw right through you. He went right to your soul and uh, your soul started speaking to him. It ignited something in you that all of a sudden you had words that you didn't even think you had. And you had thoughts about yourself that you didn't think, even think you had. You know, Peter Himmelman was our guest on Tuesday and um, he, he puts it in a beautiful way. When he, I think he wrote about this once, but he told me this too. I asked him how uh, he summarizes the Rebbe. Not that anyone can summarize the Rebbe, but 
his response was was so so spot on and he said that have you ever been in a place where you felt so terrible about yourself and then here comes someone and makes you feel even more terrible um i said yes i think everyone has he said well meeting the rebbe was experiencing the exact opposite feeling maybe terrible about yourself but then the rebbe came and he made you feel like the giant of the world why because he sparked that soul that divinity within you and when you're connected with your soul you feel divine you know that you're infinite and that's that's really what the rebbe did so he spoke the language of the soul more than he spoke french to me or other languages to other people next question about the rebbe so dear rabbi i was so moved to see rabbi steinzels today during the fabrengen we had as many of you know many of you i know attended we had a wondrous Fabreng in a Hasidic gathering today with the students of Rabbi Steinzaltz in Israel in honor of the Rebbe's Yotzeit. And Rabbi Steinzaltz attended. He participated with his facial expressions. He was fully present. And I hope to have a recording. So I hope to share it with uh, all of you as soon as possible. But I was so moved to see Rabbi Steinzaltz today during the Fabreng. And as you know, I'm old enough to have been able to see the Rebbe. But I did not. I, I didn't know much about him, and I never thought it was important. I regret this today more than ever. Is there any way I can make this up? So here's a lovely lady who never met the Rebbe, even though she could have because she lived during the times of the Rebbe, and she regrets it now more than ever, but is there any way you can make it up? Um, so the, the question is powerful. I mean, to make up the physical... Contact with the Rebbe? No. Unfortunately, the Rebbe is no longer physically with us. But to meet the soul of the Rebbe as he met your soul, as we just spoke about, absolutely. There are multiple ways. Um, and for that, I think we have to go to the root of what the Rebbe stood for. And again, speaking about the Rebbe is like the parable of those blind men. I mentioned this today during the Fabrengen, who went to explore an elephant. But because they're blind, they didn't exactly know what type of creature they had in front of him. One held the trunk and they thought that the elephant was a big rattlesnake. The other one held the rope. They thought the elephant was a rope. Uh, uh, the tail, they thought the elephant was a rope. Another one held the leg of the elephant and they said, oh, this is a big cow. No one really grasped what an elephant really was. So too, I think the Rebbe was such a giant that no one can really grasp exactly who the Rebbe was. So many different facets, so many different stories and layers of the Rebbe that it's really going into a world that's that's too big for uh, the human mind to truly comprehend. But if I had to summarize very humbly, of course, uh, what the Rebbe stood for the most, I would say as follows. Number one, the Rebbe stood for his relentless and unconditional love to each and every human being, not just Jews, to each and every human being. The Rebbe loved you not for what you could become, not for the lineage that you had. The Rebbe loved you for who you are for the soul that you have. There's that famous story that we've mentioned, I think, in the past about the, this old woman who came uh, uh, to receive a dollar from the Rebbe and his blessing. The Rebbe would stand for hours upon hours every Sunday, for eight hours, nine hours, without a break, and would give dollars and bless people. Imagine just not just the physical labor, but the emotional effort that uh, this, this, uh, this, these blessings would... would uh, uh, would excerpt from the Rebbe. But uh, this old woman once came to the Rebbe and said, Rebbe, how could you be standing here for so long? I'm um, almost as old as you are, and I got very tired standing in the line waiting to, you, to, to see you. And the Rebbe responded so brilliantly and so beautifully, when you count diamonds, you don't get tired. Re the Rebbe saw us as diamonds. He saw every human being as a diamond. Yes, some diamonds are in the rough. Some diamonds are covered with filth and with dust but they're nevertheless diamonds. So that's number one. I think the way you can meet the Rebbe today to answer this question is by exercising the same unconditional love he had for everyone. You know, uh, Shmuley Green was at the Fabrengen today. I was reminded of the story when I saw him, uh, uh, an incredible story, but Shmuley Green's father was a big NASA professor. And uh, he was what we call today, it's a terrible label, a secular Jew who had really little accessibility and little uh, connection to, to, to his Jewish roots. And um, he slowly but surely started meeting the Chabad representative in Minnesota where he lived. 
and he started taking upon himself one mitzvah and another mitzvah. And at one point, he started really exploring the Jewish religion, uh, but as a scientist. And as a scientist, he saw many contradictions between science and religion. So he wrote a three-page letter to the rabbi asking all of his questions. I think it was a total of 27 questions of how he doesn't understand how this part of Judaism really contradicts with this part of science. The rabbi did not respond to this letter. Three years go by, just listen to this. Three years go by and um, Professor Green now writes another letter to the rabbi. They've kept in touch this whole time. And three years go by, he writes a letter about how he's so happy to have been even more connected, not to his roots, to Judaism, to his soul, and that he had decided to send his children to a Jewish camp for the first time. And the Rebbe responded to that letter saying, thank you for those good news. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to respond to the 27 questions you asked me three years ago. Now you may ask, he, he, may, he writes to Professor Green, you may ask why I waited so long. I'll tell you why, because now that I see that you're even more connected to Judaism, to your roots, to the way of life that Judaism is, now I can answer these questions because my job in life is not to win arguments. My job in life is to ignite that Jewish soul in each and every one. Now that your soul is ignited, I can answer these questions. That, that, that was the approach of the rabbi. The rabbi wasn't in it to win arguments, wasn't in it for sure not for himself, wasn't in it for, for any, any selfish reason. The Rebbe was in it for your soul. And he loved that soul so unconditionally, so passionately, that I, I don't think there's one person who met the Rebbe who didn't feel that love. Uh, that's number one. I actually prepared, I'm gonna share my screen, but it's, it's just interesting to note that the very last words in public that the Rebbe said, was just before his stroke that really debilitated him until the end of his life in 1992. But uh, the day before the stroke, he was again standing for eight hours, nine hours, giving out dollars for charity and blessing people. The very last person that came to uh, receive a dollar was a young girl being held by her, um, by her father. And as soon as she sees the Rebbe, she proclaims she she burst in a shout actually i'm going to show you the shout and then i want to make my point but um here it is let's see this is a 12 second clip don't worry but it's worth seeing especially on a day like this again this is the last or at least one of the last public words that the rebbe said and i think there's a reason for that the way God made it happen, the way the rabbi spoke, there's a reason for that. It's connected to what we just said. But this is, again, this girl being held by a father. This is at the end of that day, just before the rabbi had a stroke, the, maybe 12 hours before the rabbi had his stroke. Here we go. That's it, 11 seconds. But here is the rabbi facing a little girl after nine, hour, uh, nine hours of standing and again, exhausting himself, giving dollars and blessings to people. The little girl comes and says, Rebbe Milubavich, I love you. The rabbi's face, I don't know if you paid attention, lit up with a big smile. And then the rabbi gave another dollar to this girl and said, this is for your love. And in a way, that's the legacy that the rabbi gave us. This is for your love. Love people like I loved you. And if you love people like I loved you unconditionally, the world will change. The world will be redeemed. Then Mashiach can eventually come. That was number one. I think if we love people like the Rebbe loved people, that's one way to connect to the Rebbe. Another way to connect to the Rebbe is by um, searching within, not searching without, and finding that soul that we have. Just like the Rebbe would search for it when he would meet you, you have to search it for yourself. Find that soul, listen to it, see what it's telling you. Is it telling you to uh, get another good massage? Is it telling you to have a good coffee? Or is it telling you uh, to really pay attention to it and maybe pray or maybe do good or maybe be kind or maybe overcome an inclination, a temptation 
and do what God wants, wants of the soul to do, wants of the body to do too. The more we can pay attention to the soul, like the Rebbe paid attention to our souls, I think the more we can be connected, not just to the Rebbe, but the, to the vision of the Rebbe himself. I want to share one more clip, one last clip, I promise you. But this is again a touching clip that I think is worth seeing on uh, Gimel Tammuz, on this day of the Rebbe's yard site, because it speaks volumes about how the Rebbe affected people, but again, how the Rebbe pushed people to search for their souls within and listen to its calling. Here is the next and final clip, I promise you. I'm sharing my screen again. <coughs> Here we go. Some of you may have seen this clip, but it's worth seeing it again. In 1972, Elliot Lasky was a student at State University of New York at Buffalo. I grew up from, went to yeshivas, kept Shabbos, and at the age of 18, as many people were uh, back in the 60s, started having questions and totally left uh, the dark. Back in 1972, I was on a a uh, concert tour with the Rolling Stones uh, on uh, their American tour. It was a two-month summer tour. Uh, I was 24 years old at the time and uh, not exactly a spiritual uh, experience, let's say. But uh, several months later after that tour, I had a friend contact me from California that just came to New York from France. Uh, he was a Zen Buddhist, not Jewish. I was in the house of a very close friend of mine. His name was Chip Monk, who was uh, the staging and lighting manager for the Rolling Stones. And meanwhile, my friend is uh, laying this whole Zen Buddhist outline to me. It sounded very interesting. And for some reason, spiritually, I awakened. I'm asking myself, how can Yiddishkeit be right and the whole world wrong? That was the question that kept on percolating in my mind. And uh, I had a close relationship with Rabbi Gerari, who was the shliach in Buffalo. At the time, I was in the University of Buffalo, even though I was taking time off uh, for the music industry. Um, and I called him. And I started sharing some of the questions with him. I was in New York at the time. And he said, there's only one person that could help you. And that's the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Gave me an address. Take, uh, go to 770 Eastern Parkway. Meet my brother-in-law. I believe his name is Yossi Hengel. Uh, you seek him out. And you come exactly at this time. It was a, a bitter cold winter day in January of 1973. Um, You'll meet my brother-in-law, and the Rebbe will be going. He's coming from the oil to Daven Mincha, and he'll come out in front of 770, and maybe you'll have an opportunity to talk to him. And, um, the, I'll try to paint the picture of what I looked like at the time. I'm wearing snakeskin boot boots and tight jeans, a leather jacket, no gray, not in my beard, not in my very long hair that was shoulder length at the time. I'm waiting outside, and I saw an old limousine uh, pull up, and uh, I remember Yossi moved back away from me, and a uh, distinguished Rav comes out of the car, and I go over and approach uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And Yiddish is my first language, as I said earlier, and uh, I stopped him right in front of the steps of 770, went over to him. And in Yiddish, and I learned Yiddish at home, so there's going to be some grammatical and, and uh, errors in it. But I uh, stopped the Rebbe and said, Um Chuldik, instead of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Excuse me, are you the Lubavitcher Rebbe? Our eyes lock. I never in my life saw eyes. never saw ice. 
like the Rebbe Zayis before. And he didn't say, yes, I am the Rebbe. He didn't say, no. He said, what is your name? And where are you from? Give him my name. Tell him where I'm from, where my parents are from. And I said, I have a question. He says, Fred, ask. And I ask him, and our eyes are locked. It's, uh, all of a sudden, it's like there's nothing around us, just the two of us. It was an incredibly spiritual experience for me. And I asked him, I've always got, where is God? And the rabbi answers me, Umitu, every place. I said, Chves, I know. Obadavu, but where? And he again, answers again, in Yiddish we're talking. Umitu, in us, in everything, in every place. In a bain, in a tree, in a shtain, in a stone. I'm quoting word for word. And I say to the rabbi, I know, but where? And he said something that really blew me away, so to speak. He said, in thine hearts, it does is be the flex in your heart, if this is how you're asking. I found that it would be difficult to express myself in philosophical terms. Yiddish, I asked him if I can switch to English, and he said, speak in English. And our eyes are still totally locked. I felt like we were transported to another time, to another place, really transcending the physical bounds. And I asked him, isn't it when we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alokeinu, Hashem Echel, whether you are a Jew, or a black man, or an Indian, there's only one God for all of us. And the Rebbe answered, the essence of the black man is to be what he is as a black man. And the essence of the Indian is to be what he is as an Indian. And the essence of the Jew is tied to Hashem Yisbarach through Torah and Mitzvahs. And those for me was very, very powerful words. We spoke for approximately 15 minutes on the steps of 770 in a very, very bitter, cold day in January. And he gave me two things to do. One, to learn the kids of Shulchan Aruch in English, and the other to start putting on tefillin. The Rebbe went on. I guess I must have kept him from Mincha. And uh, I went back to my friend's place um, I didn't change the next day. I didn't change two, three weeks later. But about two, three months down the line, I started putting on film, which I had not put on for several years. From that day till today, I've never missed. And as they say, mitzvah, gererus mitzvah. One mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. Baruch Hashem, today I have uh, four beautiful children, all of them in Derech Hashem. Uh, okay, all right. So, um, back to that second point, as we saw so beautifully uh, told by that story. The Rebbe searched for your soul within you and believed that uh, the more we pay attention to that soul, the happier and more fulfilled we'll be. So that's part number two. And part number three, dare I say, uh, again, that the Rebbe... Uh, as he portrayed in his own life, was a big believer in deeds, in action. That's what makes you who you are. You could have all the feelings in the world. You could be as confused or as clear as possible in your mind and in your heart. But at the end of the day, what will define you will be your actions. The Rebbe was a man of tremendous actions. The Rebbe never, never took a day of vacation. He never slept. Why? He was busy with action. He was busy changing the world so many times. He would, he would uh, tell people, forget what the doctors say about this mental disease or that, that behavior that you have or that addiction. Start doing good. The more you do good, the more you'll become good. And I think that with that emphasis on action and relentless action, the Rebbe not just uh, changed the way we think, but he also changed the world. Um, so that, that, those are three things to answer, going back to that question. 
think those are three ways we can really connect to the Rebbe, especially on such a holy day like today, the day of his yard site. Okay. You know, I, I just, it, it's coming to mind, but the, I, I wrote about this um, yesterday in honor of Gimel Tammuz, but the Rebbe never thought about himself. Never, never. The Rebbe almost did not exist as an individual person. Everything about him was about the other. Um, he, he was constantly thinking about the other. There's a woman uh, that wrote to him uh, saying that um, I, I'm, I'm giving birth, but I have, a comp I have a complicated situation. She was in Brazil. And I need the Rebbe to pray for me. And the Rebbe prayed for her. And he didn't hear back. And at 6 a.m., this is the whole night he's praying for her. At 6 a.m., uh, she finally calls to say, I want you to know, Rebbe, I finally gave birth. And Baruch Hashem, thanks to your blessings, my, um, my baby came out well and everything is good. And the Rebbe said, can I ask you a question that this happened about half an hour ago at 5.30 a.m.? And the woman was stunned and she said, yes, Rebbe, how did you know? And the Rebbe said, that's, that's when I started feeling this weight uh, off my shoulders. I knew that you had given birth Baruch Hashem healthily. But that's how the Rebbe felt. Now, whether he had these superpowers to feel like that, the Rebbe took upon himself all of the pains, all of the suffering of the entire world. And he knew exactly what was happening in every corner of the world because it was never, ever about him. It was about him being the, the ultimate transparent, clear channel of God in this world. And in a way, I think that the more we focus on the deeds towards others, the more we become that channel, the more we can truly connect to the Rebbe and to his way of life. Okay, that's, that's that. Let's move to the next question. Uh, moving on from Gimel Tammuz, never moving on from Gimel Tammuz, taking Gimel Tammuz with us, but moving on to the next topic. So, um, now there's no particular order. So, uh, I've been thinking of this question recently, as I've read through the last several portions of the Torah, I'm going to skip some of the lines here. But um, the question is as follows. Who wrote the Torah moving forward from Mount Sinai? What actually was given to Moshe at Har Sinai? What did he receive thereafter? That's the question. Who wrote the Torah? It's an excellent question because it's true. On Mount Sinai, the Jewish people received the Ten Commandments. What happened to the rest of the Torah? What's with the five books of Moses that we read, a portion of them each and every Shabbat? Who wrote them? So uh, actually the commentaries speak about this. Maimonides speaks about this. Nachmanides speaks about this. Speaks about this. Rashi himself speaks about this. The Talmud speaks about this. There are multiple opinions. And um, I'll go through them. Not all of them. I'll go through maybe the three most dominant ones. First, the common denominator between all opinions is that the Torah was given by God. No word in the Torah was not divinely authored. That's the common denominator between all opinions. The Torah indeed is a, is a divine book. Every single word, every single letter of the Torah was dictated by God himself. The question is, when did we receive the Torah? Did we receive it part by part? Did we receive the entirety of it, Amman Sinai? So there is one opinion that says, that Ahmad Sinai, we received every story of the Torah that occurred until Mount Sinai. How did we receive the rest of the Torah? As we were progressing into the years, God delivered the rest of the Torah part by part, or as it says, Megillah, Megillah, scroll by scroll to Moses. And by the end of his life, he collected all of these scrolls together and composed the five books of Moses. That's one opinion. Another opinion is no that the entire Torah was received on Mount Sinai by Moses. When he stood there for 40 days and 40 nights, he not only received the Ten Commandments, he received all the Torah. So the question is, well, then the Jewish people knew the future because the Torah speaks of the events also of after Mount Sinai. So they knew the future. So <clears throat> the answer to that is no, they did, it wasn't revealed to them. Moses knew the future, but Moses was a holy man that had the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, that had prophecy. So he anyway knew the future. So for him, it wasn't a big deal. The, he didn't reveal what was written in the Torah until the end of his life when he finally delivered all of the Torah that he had received 
on Mount Sinai. Uh, the third opinion is similar to this one, and that's an opinion where uh, God gave Moses uh, the whole Torah except for the book of Devarim, the fifth book of Moses. So Moses received the whole Torah on Mount Sinai, except for the fifth book. The fifth book was written during the last day or the last days of his life, because that's what the fifth book really speaks, including the death of Moses was written in, uh, uh, in Moses' lifetime, during the end of his life. Moses was writing about his own death, because it speaks about the death of Moses. But the Talmud has a beautiful description of how could Moses write about his own death and the Talmud responds that God dictated to Moses exactly which letters, what words to write. And Moshe Kotev Bedema, I'm quoting word for word, Moses was writing with tears flowing from his eyes, knowing that that's it, he's going to die. But God told him to write, he was going to write about his death nonetheless. Um, so that's that. I, I want to add just a little uh, commentary that comes to mind, the commentary of Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar. Um, he was one of the uh, most dominant rabbis of, in the history of Jews in Morocco. He lived some 400 years ago. He was buried in the Mount of Olives. We spoke about him, I think, in the past, but his grave is really the only grave that was not destroyed by the Palestinians in 1948. They destroyed every single grave they could find, by the way, including my great-great-grandfather's grave. Thank God we found it recently, and, and my father found it and, and rebuilt it. But the Orochim's grave was the only grave that stood erect. And the story is because they tried to destroy it, but the bulldozer that they used flipped and the driver died. Then they came with a hammer, and the hammer exploded in the guy's face, and he died. So they said, this is a holy man, we're not going to touch him. But the Orochim writes something beautiful. I just want to share with you, speaking about who wrote the Torah and how it was written. So the Orochim says that God gave Moses, when he had to write the full Torah, he gave Moses the exact amount of ink to write every letter in the Torah. And what the goal was that when Moses would finish writing the Torah, there would be not one drop of ink left. But when Moses was told to write in the Torah that Moses is the most humble man in the world, which by the way, we read two weeks ago, that Moses was the, the most humble man of all. Moses was so humble, he didn't want to write that. So he actually purposely left out a letter in the word humble, in the word anav, which means humble. He took out the yud because he didn't want to write that he was humble. So now when Moses finished writing the letters of the Torah, he has a drop of ink left from that yud that he purposely took out because he was too humble to write that he was the most humble. So what did God do with that drop of ink? God took that drop of ink and sprinkled it on Moses' face. And when he came down from Mount Sinai, as we read, his face was shining to the point that the, the Jewish nation couldn't look at him. Why was it shining so much? Rabbi Chaim ben Atar says it was shining because of the ink that was sprinkled on his face from the youth that he had purposely left out. It's a beautiful commentary, but that relates to this question. Okay, next uh, question. So I have a question during prayers of healing yard site celebrations and other times when we refer to the son of or daughter of when do we use the mother's name and when do you use the father's name so it's a good question it's true some prayers we use the father's name we say you know david ben moshe and sometimes we use the mother's name david ben leah say for example when do we use the mother's name when we use the father's name so uh, typically, we use the mother's name when we ask for someone's full and speedy recovery. Uh, the reason we do that is first and foremost because King David did that. There's a psalm, Psalm 118, um, where King David prays to God and he says, Ani avdecha ben amatecha. I am your slave, the son of your, my mother. So he refers to his mother in a time of distress. So too, we refer to our mothers in times of distress to emulate King David. But there's a deeper reason. That is because in Judaism, we believe in matrimonial uh, uh, Jewish descent. And um, your mother is really the essence of your creation. That's where you were developed for nine months before you came out and, uh, uh, and began a life here on planet Earth. So she really represents the very foundation of your creation. That foundation, which by the way, was molded, shaped, 
and, and created by your mother partnering with God. Without God, your fetus couldn't have developed. Yes, your mother played a big role, but also God. So when we ask for uh, mercy, when we ask for someone to have a full speed and speed recovery, for example, then we too go back to that essence of creation, almost saying to God, look, there you helped us. There you helped our bodies develop and heal. So now, please help us too. That's why we go back to the essence of creation. There's another beautiful commentary that says that we actually evoke the mother's name because as we know, mothers typically are much more compassionate than fathers. So, um, therefore, they just have it. The, you know, the motherly feeling is irreplaceable. But um, you can agree, disagree. But this is the clay car of, of, of Prague. The chief rabbi of Prague in the 1500s says, since we are arousing God's compassion, we are speaking about mothers who also will remind God to be at least as compassionate as the mothers are. That's another reason. But for other matters, for example, when you receive an aliyah to the Torah, then you are called by your father's name. Why? Because those other matters typically relate to the tribe that you belong to. The tribe you belong to really was dependent on your father. If you're a Kohen, that means your father was a Kohen. If you're a Levi, your father was a Levi. And in order to exactly categorize you uh, based on the tribe you came from, we have to look at your father and therefore we mention your father's name. So that's to answer this question. Okay, uh, next question. So dear Rabbi, this summer is different than many other summers, but we are still going on vacation and many of us are planning trips. There's something free and fresh about summers. Are there any Jewish tips you can share with us about how to have a fulfilling and enjoyable summer? So a good question. Good question about how to, best, how to make the best out of your summer in a the, in the, in the, in the Jewish way. First of all, uh, I will, I'm reminded of the custom that many congregations across the world have during the summer. And that is that every Shabbat, they read another chapter from the ethics of our fathers. Why? Because the ethics of our fathers teach us about ethics, Jewish ethics. Now, why do we have to read that in the summer? Because that's the first thing that comes to mind. And I'll say a few more things. The summer, indeed, as you described here, is a time of uh, something free and fresh about summers. Yes, it's a time of freedom and freshness. Maybe that's how people feel. There's certainly more physical liberty, vacation time in the summer, yeah. but uh, that freedom we know can be dangerous because if freedom doesn't have purpose, freedom doesn't have a direction, it becomes not freedom, it becomes chaos. It becomes dangerous. By the way, statistics, statistics show that. I, I don't know if you know this, but uh, many different statistics show this. Crime, the rate of crime goes up in the summer. Uh, the rate of uh, spouses cheating on each other go up in the summer. Why? Because we don't know what to do with all that freedom. We think that freedom is freedom from all rules. That will create chaos. Freedom doesn't have responsibility, direction, or purpose. Then it's not freedom anymore. And that's why we read the ethics of our fathers each and every Shabbat to remind us of our morals, of our ethics, of our purpose, and to somehow uh, create responsibility within liberty so that the liberty is not lost. So that's, that's number one. I think that's, that's one of the most important tools uh, to deal with summers in general. And yes, you're right, the summer is a little bit different, but you're right, more, more people are still on vacation and so on. But we need to create responsibility in order for that liberty to be as focused and as meaningful and as enjoyable as possible. That's number one. Number two, I would say this, it's interesting, but if you think about this, the Jewish summer is, um, barely exists. That summer that you're referring to really doesn't exist uh, in Judaism. Why? Because let's say the summer begins sometime during Passover. That's the earliest time maybe it begins. So then for seven weeks, we're counting time, right? Sfirata Omer. We're counting the days and the weeks until Shavuot. So you're immersed, you're, you're not as free as you think you are, you're immersed counting each and every day. Number two, then another thing you do in the summer is for three weeks we mourn. We mourn the destruction of the temples. We mourn other tragedies. 
That happened in the past. Tisha B'Av is the climax of that morning, the ninth of Av, where we fast for 25 hours. And we mourn the destruction of the temples, the beginning of the Spanish Inquisition that happened in Tisha B'Av, the beginning of the First World War that happened in Tisha B'Av, many other tragedies that happened. So for three weeks we're mourning. Again, there's no liberty there. And then the summer continues on until the high holidays. And for the entire month of Elul and the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, where we spend in doing teshuva, in repenting, in self-introspection, in trying to change the ways that need to be changed. So we don't really have much of a summer, at least not a fresh and free summer as you were writing. But I think it's purposeful. Number, because those three things that we are immersed in during the summer really give us maybe the three tools of how to best actualize our summit. Tool number one is count your time. Time is valuable. In the summer, people squander their time like, like no, nothing before. And that's why, again, crime rates go up. Uh, cheating rates go up. Many other rates go up. Boredom and the squandering of time, I think, is the greatest danger to any individual to any family, to any community, and to any society, no doubt. So count your time, make sure you have a schedule, make sure you have a direction to your time, make sure you fulfill it with purpose, with meaning, with content, that's number one. Number two, the other exercise we have is that we mourn, but we're not just mourning, we're connecting to our past. I think summer is a good time to say, well, where do we come from? Because as Winston Churchill famously put it, you cannot know where you are going if you do not know where you are coming from. So it's a time, like you're doing right now, to spend uh, towards exploring our heritage together, our values. Let's spend time really uh, to, to learn about the roots of us all, about our ancestors. By the way, to give you a very practical tip to this, but I, I heard this from Rabbi Steinsaltz, I'm not making this up, and I think it's one of the most brilliant pieces of advice but I would encourage every one of you, I'm sure you have an ancestor in your family, a grandfather, a grandmother, a great grandfather, great mother, whatever, that was considered to be a saint, considered to be, wow, a pious man or a pious woman. So take those pictures, now during the summer, connect to those people, and then hang them on the walls of your home. You'll be surrounded by their love. You'll be surrounded by them. And each time you come home, you'll remember where you came from. I promise you it will change your life. So that's number two, connecting to our past, even in the most practical way. And number three, as we connect to our past, we have to also explore our souls, like this, this wonderful man was speaking about and how the, the, the Rebbe changed his life by telling him that God is not just everywhere, God is in your heart. Let's, let's spend those days also of the summer to better ourselves, but to unleash that divine soul that we each have. I think summer is a great time to set goals, based on what the soul wants, not just what the body wants. And to try and uh, then uh, uh, re, re, uh, investigate those goals the next summer to see if we really accomplish them. Soulful goals, again, not just bodily goals. So I think that's the best way to actualize uh, your summer. Last question. Oh, there we go. So, dear rabbi, I'm going to skip a few lines because it's, it's, it's also very personal, but I'm going to get to the question itself. Um, uh, this COVID-19 has darkened my life. I can't seem to get rid of the negativity. Uh, I go to sleep afraid. I wake up in a better mood, but fear then invades my mind. And I'm not gonna go into the details. She's afraid about all sorts of things. Um, but how can I overcome this fear? That's, that's the bottom line. So this is a, a person suffering, like many of us are, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, COVID-19 hasn't been easy for anyone. Um, and it fills people with doubts, with fears. And how can you overcome this fear and this negativity? Um, so first of all, as I always say, I'm happy, I know, I know uh, that you might be listening to this, not just maybe on the screen, but maybe later on in the, in the recording. And I'm happy to reach out uh, to you and to sit down with you and to try and figure out detail after detail and see really how, how the things that you mentioned can, can better themselves. 
But how do you overcome fear? I recognize it's really one of the greatest problems that are embedded in the human condition, in human existence. Uh, there's no, it's, it's not by chance that uh, the words pronounced by God of al tira do not be afraid, are mentioned over 80 times in the Torah. Do not be afraid, because God recognizes that that's again embedded in the human condition. By the way, he mentions those words, al tira not to you know, the, the common folk, but to Abraham, to Jacob, who's afraid many times, by the way. So I understand that fear is, is a part and parcel of, of who we are. But I will say a few things about fear that will hopefully help you overcome fear. Um, number one, I, I will point out what the Kabbalists teach. You know, it's interesting, but the word for fear in Hebrew is yiga. Yiga. That's the word that's used. Al tiga. Do not be afraid. Yiga. Now, the word for fear in Hebrew is also the exact same word for vision. For vision. Why? Because God, in the word fear, is giving us perhaps the most important tool of, on how to overcome fear. Because where does fear come from? Fear comes from our inability to see the blessing within the challenge, the opportunity within the trouble, to see the light within the darkness. What we see what is, is very often very limited when we're afraid, and that's what creates fear. So God is telling us, do you want to overcome fear? Continue to use your eyes. But don't limit them to what the physical eyes are seeing. Use your spiritual eyes too. Dig deeper. And within that situation that you find yourself in, you'll find the greatest blessing. I think that's, that's, that's a powerful idea. In fear, there is vision. All we have to do is open up our eyes. That's why, again, it shares the same word. So that's one tool. Don't get stuck by what you, you think you are seeing. But dig deeper. Whatever the situation is, and I know you've mentioned a few examples that I didn't mention out loud, but, but there, there is opportunity in everything. Speaking of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe was, was a man who embraced challenge. However hard the challenge was, he was a man who suffered terribly throughout his life. He was, uh, 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 to mention just a few things, he was divorced uh, from his parents because his, his parents were sent to exile. And uh, his father was the rabbi of Yekaterina Slav, the, the city where he was born. And he was accused of teaching Judaism and was tortured by Stalin. And he eventually died in exile. The rabbi, of course, could not go to his funeral. Didn't see his father for many years uh, uh, until his death. Uh, the rabbi didn't see his father. Um, the rabbi then faced the Holocaust. He lost his own brother to the Nazis. The rabbi then came to America uh, with complete devastation behind him. And yet the rabbi built um, himself, built... Uh, his Hasidic uh, group, the Chabad Hasidim, and built the world with the determination that history has, had never seen before. So, so the Rebbe embraced challenges. What gave him the strength to embrace challenges? Exactly that. The Rebbe, as a holy man, knew that there is so much more to what the naked eye sees. What seems is not what there is. And uh, sometimes we have to be able to dig deeper and try and find that blessing, try to focus on it, and then go with it relentlessly. So that's number one. Another way to overcome fear, if that tool number one is too hard, and sometimes it is, simply not to think about it. Occupy your mind with something else. You know, Nelson Mandela, I know we've mentioned this in the past, speaking about resentment, says it's like letting someone else live in your mind rent-free. So I would say the same thing about fear. It's about letting whatever it is that's causing you fear to live in your mind rent-free but you are the master of your mind. So then kick those things out and replace the thoughts with other thoughts. The Perfect. thoughts of fear, with thoughts of, of, uh, of self-actualization. -actual thoughts of uh, what you are grateful for in life. That I think is another tool. And last but not least, uh, the third tool I think uh, to overcome fear is to also almost uh, what we said at the beginning about the Lubavitcher Rebbe, start doing things that create happiness. Uh, maybe fear sometimes comes simply from passivity. And, you know, we say what will be, I don't know. And that was never a Jewish question. The Jewish question is, what can we do? Focus on action. 
do things that are uh, that create optimism for others do things that create happiness for others and you'll see that those fears will fade away and your mind will then be replaced with happiness so those are i think three tools on how to overcome fear and to quote someone that i would rather not quote but since he said it we'll say it Maimonides says that ta'amid, wisdom you have to accept from whoever it comes from. So Roosevelt famously said that we have nothing to fear but fear, fear itself. itself. <laughs> and uh, to overcome that fear, let's follow those three tools.